Welcome to Clutch Burners Podcast. Um, tonight we've got the one and only Mark Shiflet from G Force Transmissions. Um, I would say he's the uh, deliverer of dreams or great frustrations. It depends on who you ask. <laughs> Rich, do you care to chime in? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, uh, Bill and I, and yeah, he's he's the go-to guy. I mean. Uh, We've been dealing with Mark uh, lots. We're learning lots with Mark, um, but he takes good care of us. So, yeah, if you don't know who Mark Shifflett is and G-Force is, uh, you might be on the wrong podcast. <laughs> that is a fact. Um, so, so actually, before we start, I think, Rich, tell us how your day went today. Did you have a little story uh, or something about today? Well, it started yesterday, actually. So, drove, drove down. Um, to Medicine Hat, which is about 200 miles away, uh, towing a trailer, doing the speed limit uh, ish, and um, <clears throat> yeah, with the G force pulling it, getting like 17 miles to the gallon, get to the did track. You, did sweet. you confuse kilometers and miles an hour again on the speed limit? Yeah, I, yeah, I think I did actually more than more than once. Um, <laughs> uh, get to the track, switch it all over go up and it's uh it, this one's a, a street race so the qualifying is the street race and then you go right into eliminations and as i do my burnout i'm leaking water so i uh, i'm instantly out make the second pass um now i'm in test and tune and uh shift it into go to go from two to three and it feels like third gear is gone or something something bad has happened uh, it had nothing to do with the transmission. It turns out it was uh, a map sensor blew off. Um, fixed that, went up and went 585 at 129 miles an hour, which is probably a 880, 890 in my 4,000 pound car. Pretty happy nice. with that. But when I went to download the data log, it, uh, it wasn't there. So I lowered the boost a little because I had a little bit of a backfire. Um, and so, uh, I go up for my next pass and I'm at lower boost and I do a big burnout. And, um, as I come out of the burnout and I'm rolling up to the, uh, staging beams, there's, I have a light, um, that kind of flashes when I have low oil pressure. This and is I may... one right in front of your face, right? <laughs> Pretty Brian's much. Day, can't miss it. Right. It's right there. It's right in front yep. of my face. Okay. It flashed a couple of times as I'm rolling up there and I'm thinking, hmm, that's odd. And it comes on at about 16 pounds oil pressure. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's, that usually doesn't do that. But I'm I'm in the zone. I stage. <laughs> I get up on the two-step and I let her go. And, and the pass is decent. It's like 599 with a little less boost. Pull off the track. And instantly I see my oil pressure, which is normally 20 to 25 hot. It's at like 10 now. And that light is like flashing in my face. And so I drive it back to the pit um, and I have a clear view filter. I blow my filter out and there's nothing really in there. And I know what a bad bearing looks like. And it doesn't look like there's any issues with, with a bearing. So we change the car all over. We leave the track. I can still tell it is not, oil pressure is not <laughs> where it's supposed to be. So we eat dinner. Uh, now I got 200 miles to go. We eat dinner, let the thing cool down. I'm thinking, nah, maybe the oil is just hot. Well, it apparently stayed hot for the whole hour and a half we were in the restaurant because when we got out, got back on the highway doing 80 miles an hour, and with the G Force, that's like 1700 RPM in my car. My oil pressure is at about mm, 18 psi. So you had like zero W5 in the pan at this point, right? Yeah, it, right. it, it was holding the heat really, <laughs> really well, apparently. <laughs> and so um, I had 200 miles to go. And I thought, well, let's just keep driving it and see if the oil pressure drops or if it stays the same. If it stays the same, ah, there's got to be something else going on. There's no bad bearings or anything. Indication, so we drove it. Indication issue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so cruising along i mean at like 1900 rpm which may or may not be 90 miles an hour um oil pressure was like 21 pounds it was like oh got lots 
Now, on the way down, at the same RPM, it would have been about 42 <laughs> PSI. <laughs> so it's like there is something drastically changed here. So <clears throat> as I'm going home, of course, you're running through a few towns. And when you stop at an intersection, all pressure goes whoosh, down to like 9, 10 pounds at idle. <clears throat> and it's cold out. It's not like it's not like I'm running 210. I'm like 175 degrees on the coolant. But the oil and, must uh, be 510 degrees. Well, it's zero that kind w, of pressure. Zero W zero at this point, I think. <laughs> yeah, and I'm doing that too. I'm thinking, oh, I wonder that Royal Purple, man. I don't know. It, but I really beat it up in that one run. <laughs> I can't believe how much it's dropped. <laughs> Anyways, I come home. I look in the data log. I make it all the way home. Oil pressure never changes. It's like 20 pounds all the way home, except for when I stop at intersections. And... um I look at the data log and I can see in the data log that it happened during the burnout. Something went on in the burnout. And I've had it before with a Pontiac where you get something stuck in the relief ball. So it relieves at about 70 pounds. So you have to be over 70 pounds. And then when the ball goes to sit on the seat, something gets trapped in there. So mm. I don't know. I guess I should have got a lottery ticket or something. Um, so the next morning I fired up or this morning I fired up. And it's got about 60 pounds cold. Um, and usually if you rev it at all, like even at 2000, it'll instantly start dumping at 70 and it's not doing it. <clears throat> so then I hit the throttle hard. <clears throat> I give it like 45, 5,000. I'm sure my neighbors love me. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden I can instantly tell that everything's changed. Um, took it for a rip, got everything nice and hot. Oil pressure's right back to normal. So it's pretty clear that I had something st stuck in the relief ball. And the, the problem is, is the only way to get it out is you, I, I guess I could drain the oil and throw it up a cold stuff. But I tell you, the stuff you're thinking while you're driving home and you're trying to mow it, oh, it must be the sensor's gone bad or something. It's gotta be, <laughs> the car's not making any noise. This can't be true. Like, I just keep driving. The oil pressure's not changing. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. I was, I was right. I knew, I, I knew what the problem, I had an idea of what the problem was, but uh, thankfully, honestly, if I didn't have a G-Force and I wasn't cruising at, you know, such a low RPM, I might not even have picked up the change, but uh, I also knew that cruising at such a low RPM, if it was really chewing itself up, it wouldn't chew itself up as quick. <laughs> not at 17 as compared to like 3,500 RPM or 3,000, but... So yeah, that that was my day. I feel way better now. I yeah. Did I, that I, did that test drive entail buying a lottery ticket? I hope, or did you did yeah. you waste the moment? <laughs> no, I I uh, I just got to check it now. Okay. <laughs> All right, Mark. <clears throat> so, give us a give us a brief history of G Force, kind of like where you guys came from and how you've become kind of the go to for this kind of racing transmission type stuff. Okay, so basically, uh, Leonard Long started the company in 1979, um, doing long shifters, um, did that for years, uh, had the aerospace uh, contracts, and then around 95 or so, he actually bought uh, G-Force, uh, which was originally a company out of Michigan. Um, so he bought that, and then we moved to a uh, shop in Anvil, where he uh, still had the machine shop and uh, did the shifters and everything. So we moved G-Force into there. And then around 2005, we moved to the current building we're at um, and started doing the transmission stuff. And we got G-Force South in about uh, 2009. Um, well, about 2005, 2006, G-Force South. And then we bought Tex Racing and incorporated that into G-Force South. Uh, and they do all of our basically NASCAR stuff. And then our pen they're out of North Carolina. Then our Pennsylvania shop uh, is where we do all the shif shifters, the manufacturing, um, and the assembly of all the gearboxes. Nice. And I, actually, I'd like to say uh, congratulations to Leonard. He just uh, locked up another championship. And uh, the M NMCA 10-5 um, locked that up today again uh, with a win. Nice. Nice. Awesome. Congratulations. Nice. Yeah, that's congratulations. <clears throat> um, okay, so Mark, what is your background? Like, how did you get involved with G Force? And I think you may have mentioned it there, but 
Uh, I went to school, uh, uh, CTC or Votech, uh, for automotive uh, technology. I worked in shops until about 2007. Um, then when I was 24, I started working for uh, Leonard and G-Force. Um, and actually, this last August would have been my 15th year. Um, so pretty happy with with everything that's going on there, meeting guys like uh, you that, that keep things exciting. Definitely the drag and drive events, um, seeing all the miles and uh, just the dedication of having to fix your cars at the track and on the side of the road is uh, pretty cool. It gets a lot of respect from me. Well, thank you. I'm flattered. 15 years with GeForce. So yes. let's see, 25. So you just turned 30 years old today then, did you? So off by about eight years. <laughs> Nine, so, 39. So it is, in fact, your birthday today, though, isn't it? Yes. So, Rich, should we sing a little happy birthday to Mark? Uh, how many uh, how many people do we want to lose in the podcast? All right, we'll, we'll bypass that then. <laughs> they know they know how bad it can sound. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> well, happy birthday, Mark. Thank yes. you. Um, and thanks for spending it with us. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, because you're uh, you're two hours ahead, so it's it's uh, probably getting dark out there. Uh, yeah, it's got dark about seven thirty. It's a little little after uh, eight, I believe now. Okay. Well, we'll try not to keep you up past your bedtime. <laughs> Um, how many employees are there at G-Force? Um, G-Force, the Pennsylvania shop, we have about, I'd say about 30. Um, G-Force South, I'm not quite sure. We probably have about 15 or 20 down there. Um, so I'd say all in all total about, uh, about 50 employees or so company-wide. Wow, that's nice. awesome. And, and I'm just curious for my own knowledge, like, What's a machinery layout look like? Like how many CNCs do you have? Like, what does that all look like? Cause those are a big deal. I mean, the operators and everything, that's a big deal. Yeah. So our shop set up, we have uh, our own area for transmission assembly. Um, we have our own uh, department for the shifters and then um, the machines are all set up uh, in a way too. So all the mills are in one area, all the lathes are in one area. And then we have a, a saw shop and a gear shop. Um, I would say all in all, we probably have, it's just an estimate, maybe 50 CNC machines, uh, from gear cutters, uh, to lathes, to the mills. Um, that way we can do everything in-house, uh, except for heat treating. Did, did I just hear you right? Five, zero, 50 CNC machines? Uh, probably about 50. Like I said, that's an estimate. We have some in Pennsylvania and we do have some in, uh, our North Carolina shop as well. That is awesome. That's awesome. Actually, that's that's one thing that I really appreciate about GeForce is the fact that you guys make your own stuff. So now we're going to talk about supply chain issues in a bit. But uh, yeah, I really appreciate that piece. That's that's the next one. Go ahead. How are they being affected by supply chain and what parts are hard to get right now? Uh, so right now, being that we make our own parts, we can control that a little bit as long as we can get the raw materials, uh, which that's starting to be the hold up. Um, that's starting to affect us and pretty much any of the manufacturers that are using uh, 9310 alloy, which is basically what a bulk of your aftermarket gear sets are made out of. Um, so where you get that material in a couple of days, a week, uh, two weeks max, it's now taking uh, several months to get. So we have to be on top of ordering material, making sure we have enough uh, to keep the parts going through the shop. Uh, now, once the material is in the shop, we can control um, basically the, the, the speed of how they go through the shop, depending on the amount of work we have. Uh, but right now, the biggest issue is stuff we don't uh, manufacture in-house, which would be um, bearings. Uh, they come from overseas. Typically, we use anything... Um, We'll use American made, uh, Japanese made, uh, you know, SKF and um, NTN, uh, Tempkin, but those have been getting harder to get. So that's a little bit of hold up on transmissions. But again, the, the parts we make, the hard parts we make um, aren't too big of a problem because we can control that in-house once we have the material. Does that mean Rich and I should order 
any parts that we might think we are going to break like tomorrow? Actually, six feet parts were good on. So <laughs> <laughs> awesome! That's the best news ever. <laughs> yeah, we can keep you guys going for sure. Awesome. Well, well, yeah. I know we appreciate it, and I know there's there's a bunch of guys, um, <clears throat> that like Chad Fagley who kicked both of our butts at race week this year. Um, he's running one of your transmissions as well, so that's awesome. Yeah, All right, good. so I see we have uh, well, he he won that, and then obviously Rich won uh, sick week, and I think uh, Ted won uh, miles of mayhem. If I'm not mistaken. Uh, Nope. He actually won uh, Rocky Mountain Race Week. He okay. The the wrong one. Yeah. Yeah. Due, due to um, attrition. <laughs> yeah. Hey, don't, don't, come on now. Don't take that away from him. No, no, no. I, I didn't mean that in a bad way, but you and I both broke uh, first time together. Um, yeah. But he, he did awesome. Ran his first nine second pass. Like, it was actually really exciting to see him do all that. Like, it was nice to be on the sidelines watching it. Yeah. Yeah, I was just out with him in his car, and um, yeah, he just he he loves that transmission. He loves to drive that thing. Um, <clears throat> and he, you know, before he would trailer everywhere, but since he's put that transmission in, he's just like, I just want to drive. He's like, I want to go to Sick Week with you. <laughs> like, let's drive thirty five hundred miles in the car. There's only one reason we can do that, though, and that's because we're not beating the shit out of everything with uh, a six speed. So. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> All right. I got I got the questions in front of me now, so that might help, but yes. Go for it. Go for it. <clears throat> okay, Mark, let's uh, roll into these other questions here. So what, what, in your opinion, what is the most important step when installing a manual? The uh, most important step, I would say, is indicating the bell housing in. Um, and the reason for that is we have a lot of people that think, because it's a new part out of the box, they don't have to do anything. They can bolt it on and go. But um, what happens if you don't in indicate it in, and um, I think most manufacturers specs within five, uh, five thousandths, um, when you're mating the transmission to the motor, if it's not indicated in, we've seen bell housings off 10, 20,000. So if uh, the pilot's not going into the bearing properly, you can have problems with, um, you know, uh, the clutch disc sticking, uh, pilot bearing uh, wear and failure, um, as well as possibly breaking the pilot off the transmission um, and shiftability issues, especially in uh, your direct drive gear, which for you guys would be in fourth gear. Uh, for some of the aftermarket transmissions could be fourth or fifth gear. <clears throat> nice. And um, so why do you think that stick shift racing has grown so much. I mean, it seems like, and Rich and I may have uh, rose colored glasses on or a little bias, but it seems like it's really picked up in the last few years. I think a lot of that is social media has grown so much. Um, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, uh, YouTube, you have a lot of great personalities uh, given the coverage, uh, like with uh, Kyle Boost Lifestyle going with, Rich, um, that's actually how I watch to see what you guys are doing every day when you post. Um, but really, you can get on Facebook, um, Instagram, YouTube. There's live feeds or uh, you know people posting videos uh, of races happening all over the world. So you can get a lot more information from guys that are racing, and uh, you can build a better following because you don't actually have to go to the track to you know follow um, follow your friends or follow. You know, somebody, uh, you might follow a YouTube channel. They might be racing over in Australia or Japan. And you can follow them just by, you know, getting online on social media and, and following them that way. Uh, where 25 years ago, you'd have to go to the track and, and watch it or, or hopefully might have been on TV uh, if it was yeah. a big enough series. Nice. Uh, also, I, I think technology. Um, it's not a cheap sport, but I, I think most people would, agree that it's cheaper than it was um years ago there, there's uh things are more mass produced more mass produced uh the quality um has has gone up uh with a lot of manufacturers as well uh just from stuff they learned over the years uh feedback from customers um like i'll say with g-force alone the feedback we get um 
some other manufacturers might not take into consideration. But if you guys were to come to us and say, I think we can make this stronger on our transmission, you know, we take that seriously and we take that data and, you know, put it into our product. If we need to make changes, um, let's face it, everybody's got more horsepower uh, year over year. So we have to keep uh, making these things stronger as well. Nice. Yeah, I think, I think obviously it's because of all the handsome devils in uh, stick shift racing. And uh, I, I think the other piece <laughs> for me is, and I think Kyle is a great example where, you know, you can throw an LS turbo combination into a Mustang with an automatic and go out there and run faster than 850 without too much of a challenge. You can't really do that in the stick shift world. Like you need some skills. Uh, it takes some effort. Um, and then you get the benefit of being able to drive them everywhere if you want to. And even the gear ratio for me, um, like I, I, I have a ton of friends who are uh, gear vendor supporters and I think they do a fantastic job. <clears throat> I think the gear ratio with a T56 and allow you to split your six gear in half. Um, I don't know any automatic transmissions you could do that with either. So I think those for me, that's one thing that definitely keeps me in the, in the stick world. Um, but that challenge and, and the amount of fun you have, like, I mean, Kyle was convinced after we drove all the way to Florida, he's like, yeah, I end up putting an automatic back in. I got to go stick. So, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, I'll second you on that, Rich. I think people are so amazed that, you know, you can have like truly a streetable eight second car. Like it's, it's ridiculous um, that, that you can just drive it anywhere. I mean, you know, we drove to race week pulling, my trailer is probably 1500 pounds. And I think we probably drove <clears throat> the speed limit plus 20. Um, and we got 16 miles a gallon, like that first tank of gas, we had a lot of wind and it was less, but that's ridiculous. I mean, it was like 16, 1700 RPM at, uh, speed limit plus 10 or so. So yeah, like it's, it's pretty awesome. So I think another thing too, is, uh, uh, the clutch technology, um, I'd say mid 2000s, our, our regular T56 gear set, like, uh, you know, Jonathan Grubworm run, uh, you guys have the newer set. Um, uh, I mean, he's putting 2000 horsepower through that. Um, he's got the LT record, but I would say 10, 15 years ago, that same gear set, uh, not much has changed on, but guys would blow, even blow those up. Um, and it's because, a lot of guys weren't using slipper clutches or uh, like the digital clutch controller like you have. Um, and that's saving a lot of, of the drivetrain as well by uh, people using uh, slipper clutches and, and like your bank shift Billy. It just uh, helps take a lot of the shock up so it's not constantly hitting the gear so hard. So so that, that actually leads me to another question then. Um, these transmissions, how are they rated? Um, I'm going to lean towards they're actually rated on a torque rating, but everyone's like, like you said, well, he's putting 2,000 horsepower to it. But how are they rated? And the clutch is the same. I mean, they're rated actually on a torque factor, right? Uh, we always say horsepower-wise because <clears throat> 90% of the people you talk to, um, do we get do you get people asking the torque rating too? But most people you talk to um, that don't know much or are getting started um, relate more to horsepower. Um, so we will go um, – like you know, the transmission you have technically will rate that at like fifteen hundred flywheel horsepower. So we've seen about twenty one hundred to them, and that's going to be um, on the application. So that's about a thirty two hundred pound car is usually what we give that rating to. Uh, but torque, we usually with something like that, we'll rate it at fifteen hundred for flywheel, and then probably say about thirteen hundred for torque. That's moderate rating because you know some of these newer cars uh, get the same gear set you guys have. But it's not a 3,200 pound car. It's a 4,500 pound car, like 4,000 pound car, like you guys have. So there's a lot of variables in it, um, weight, uh, and, and the rest of the setup of the car. Uh, so we do rate it moderately, but we usually go by horsepower because more people tend to relate to it. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, and I think I, yeah, I'm, I'm right with you as far as I think the clutch technology and um, 
that's really what's keeping them together. Like you hit them with a hammer, you hit anything hard enough with a hammer, it's going to break it. But uh, if you can um, use your ECU, you know, use a, a clutch controller like Bill makes something to help not hit it so hard. I mean, my, my car is 4,000 pounds and 1,500 foot pounds of torque. And I, I haven't had it apart in three events. Now I'll probably pull it apart to have a look, but <clears throat> I haven't missed the shift. It is amazing how well that thing's holding up to what I'm what I'm doing to it. So and, and Rich, what clutch what clutch setup are you using? So I've got a black magic um clutch from Kale and it's a next gen. So it's a six finger um single eleven inch. And uh, I crank it up on the street um because I'm towing a trailer. And then just about take all the base pressure out and it, <clears throat> it, uh, it's honestly one of the best street strip clutches that I've had. Like it's amazing at the track. It, it l helps me launch consistently and then, uh, no problem at all pulling a trailer. That's Doing awesome. The 20 plus the speed line, um, <laughs> without, without any issues. <laughs> Well, a, 19, and let's, a 1900 rpm <laughs> yeah at 1900 rpm yeah and, and 20 pounds of oil pressure let's not forget that <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's lots i think the nascar what is it nascar or they only run like five per thousand or something so it's it's good it's all good it's all yeah good. <laughs> um you know so let's let's talk about that both bill and i run uh face plated transmissions so um What's the difference between synchronized dog ring or face plated transmission and and what are what are the benefits, Mark? Uh, so basically a synchronized transmission, um, you're gonna have blocker rings and friction material, and uh, that's gonna act like uh, in, in simple terms, it's gonna act like a, a brake pad. So you gotta slow your main shaft and your gear down to the same speed to get into the gear. Um, that's mechanically good up to about 6,500, 7,000 RPM. I know there are guys that can do it more than that, but that's typically where they start to, to uh, get notchy or block you out. Um, now, dog ring transmission like you guys have are going to have metal-to-metal -metal lugs. Uh, on ours, it's uh, eight lugs. Uh, then when you switch it into gear, it'll it'll give a clunk. Um, is, is, that the, is that the broken dump truck sound I refer to? <laughs> That is that noise, yeah. And where a synchronized uh, transmission won't do that. Uh, that's why some guys, um, like I say, it's personal preference whether you're using that on the street or not because a lot of guys don't want to do that. Now, I know you guys do a lot of street driving uh, with the dog ring transmission. Um, something you get used to, and it depends what you're doing. If it's your daily driver, for most people, they want to be synchronized. But if you're going to do any kind of racing, um, drag racing, uh, roll racing, uh, or, you know, even road racing, dog ring is, is what you want, uh, especially if you're shifting above 7,000 RPM. If you spin the motor to 10,000 RPM, you'll be able to get it into gear with a dog ring setup. Um, dog ring and face plate kind of goes hand in hand. A lot of times when uh, you're putting dogs in a stock gear set, uh, they'll call that face plating. Uh, but really, the terminology is, you know, different words for the same thing basically got it got it yeah and so so i daily drive mine <clears throat> and i've learned how to double clutch and uh but yeah so i this week coming up here i'm going racing on saturday i'm going to drive it every day on the way to work and it's like 20 kilometers 20 kilometers you know 10 it's it's about a it's about a 15 minute drive let's put it that way <laughs> and um you know, people ask me all the time, is it hard to get into gear? And it's, it's not, it'll clunk. Like if you don't double clutch and you, and you're kind of new to it, it'll almost sound like it's grinding um, sometimes, but if you're consistently and you just put it into gear, they're very easy to shift. Uh, double clutching, in my opinion, saves the, saves the gears, makes it a little easier on parts. Um but I think I've got one video out there. I think I might've sent it to you, Mark, where I was driving around with a friend and he was video and, and uh, yeah, if I'm going to take my wife for a drive and I don't want her to think I'm driving a dump truck, I'm, I can pretty much make her think that, you know, it's a normal transmission and that's not where all the money went. That might've been where all the money went, but that's that, cause she doesn't need to know that. <laughs> she's not, she's not going to listen to this podcast, right? No, no, she's, 
She listens to me as little as possible. Is she so. is she peeking around the door right now, looking at you? I'm definitely not. No. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, so Mark, in these uh, transmissions, and let's just talk about also just a synchronized one. I know you guys have an oil that you sell, um, and Jonathan Atkins showed it off on the whole bottom of his car <laughs> with that failure. Um, but it, talk about the oil that you recommend for these transmissions um, and why use it versus, you know, typical ATF in a synchronized transmission and whatnot. Yeah, so like your synchronized transmissions uh, or, or uh, transmissions with OEM uh, material, which is usually cold rolled steel, you can get away with using the, uh, I think it's Dexron uh, 3 ATF or Mercon. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have an uh, aftermarket gear set made out of a 9310 alloy, you need special additives in it because uh, it has a high nickel content. And what happens if it doesn't have that additive in, it'll start pulling the nickel out of the gears and cause pitting. And then in turn, eventually that'll cause breakage of the gear. So we recommend, um, obviously, like you said, Jonathan put it on full display, the, the blue, the blue oil. Um, that's our GF2000 advanced formula. Um, you can use that, which most, most people run. If you don't have that available, um, and you want to go down to the parts store and get oil, uh, you can get Torco, uh, Moltol, uh, Redline. Um, I'm not personally familiar with Royal Purple. I don't know if you guys are, uh, but typically any of your high-end oils like that uh, will be good. Uh, GL rating, fiber higher, fully synthetic, and uh, we typically use 75, 140. Um, and then if you're using your overdrives, uh, since they're synchronized, we'll typically use two quarts of the 75 140 and then two quarts of ATF to thin it out so the synchronizers can work um, uh, whether it's a fully synchronized transmission or uh, just the overdrives uh, if it's if you have fifth and sixth deleted I know Jonathan and a lot of those guys uh, that they are chasing the six speed record they have fifth and sixth deleted uh, so they can just run four quarts of the 75 140 well, doesn't that make it a four speed record then uh, I think they're just uh, basing it on the actual <laughs> transmission, <laughs> whether or not okay. it's four or six. Two of the gears are on the on the shelf, <laughs> but they're still part of the transmission. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then that, uh, that that blue oil, yeah, that shit sticks to everything. I think I've got <clears> spots <throat> in my garage floor where it's like I can't get that stuff out. But it so, is, yeah. yeah so an, an interesting question, like when I've added that stuff. It seems like the very last bit to come out has got some special sauce in it. It seems like I want to shake it up or swirl it before I pour it because I think some stuff settles out. Is that right? Yeah, if it's setting, it'll settle out. So we do recommend <clears throat> shaking it up before using it. Um, the stuff you see in the bottom, and this is actually why it's uh, heavily dyed, uh, which, yes, it stains stuff. It's messy to work with, but uh, it does do does do its job. But the, the stuff that settles out is actually – um ceramic that's infused in, in the oil so it actually coats the gear and it reduces friction on the gear which in turn uh, helps the transmission operate cooler um, but that's what settles out is, is that the, the ceramic and the additives that are, are in that oil so it's safe to say that i prefer my g-force oil shaken not stirred <laughs> there you go yes okay. <laughs> perfect <laughs> so oh, we're okay. talking about we're talking about oil. Uh, let's talk about spray bars. So um, unlike an automatic transmission where there's an oil pump and oil gets pumped around, the manuals, they just kind of rely on splash lubrication. But uh, talk a little bit about uh, spray bars in oil so, pumps. Yeah, so we recommend a spray bar setup and a pump system basically on any transmission that wasn't uh, – designed as a race transmission from the start because a race transmission generally uh, is designed so the gears ride low to the case and it's constantly scooping the oil up. Um, that's not always the case because in, in our GSR four speed and our GF4A four speed, uh, we have a spray bar in there and you can add an optional pump. So that's for say like road racing um, applications. Uh, short road racing, you don't really need a pump. Uh, we've seen in a lot of TA2 stuff. Uh, 
in Australia, uh, NASCAR Mexico, we have a lot of four speeds and they don't run pumps, but your longer races of maybe a few hours, you're going to want to pump. You're going to want to keep uh, circulating the oil. Um, and then I'd say anything like your Tremec based transmissions, a lot of guys who, you know, obviously using whether it's TKO, TKX or uh, the, the Magnum transmissions or TR 60s uh, you want to run the pump and nose because they are a bit bigger. The gears don't sit as low. Um, so you're going to want to get it circulated back up to your, your headset or in your, your guys' case with the six speed, your fourth gear. Um, tick spray bar system actually sprays all, all four of, uh, you know, first and fourth gear. Um, it keeps them lubricated, gets rid of all the wear issues. Cause what happens when you're drag racing, uh, or even doing half mile or mile events is <clears throat> once you get going, all that oil is going back to the tail housing. Um, now your your headset or your fourth gear is going to start uh, getting hot, overheating, and once that happens, then it's going to start breaking down, uh, possibly shatter the gears, and it's going to going to end your day. Uh, so that's why it's important to keep that oil uh, circulating in in those transmissions, and obviously keeping it cool as well. Mark, is there is there a rule of thumb for the amount of power you make before you should do a spray bar or hook up some type of spray system? I mean, I always felt like it was about 600 horsepower, but is it, in fact, less than that? Uh, I would say really going back to depending on, on what you're doing. Uh, so whether, um, I mean, I absolutely recommend it on anything. I recommend a billet front plate if you're on a six-speed uh, and the spray bar system or uh, the spray bar and pump on, on any transmission if, if you're taking the car from a dead stop uh, or a slow rolling start to uh, – to, to flooring it because all that oil is still going to the back. So whether you're 500 horsepower or, or 1500, um, that oil is still trying to go to the back. So I recommend it, but definitely, uh, the higher your horsepower and torque, um, the more you're, you're going to need it because you're putting, uh, a lot more stress on, on the drive train. Okay. Yeah. I, th I think that's, you know, I think that's one thing that's really cool is that, uh, this, the, the stick world, community you know i mean yeah you talk about tick you guys you guys basically offer your six speed and you'll you'll buy a front plate from tick and and install it uh, that's that's pretty cool it's there's not uh there's not many communities like like this one where great companies like yourself and tick work together and then uh provide us with something that lasts so that's pretty cool i appreciate you guys doing that yeah yeah and i always like working with uh you know, other companies, whether it's tech or uh, RPM transmissions, they do a lot of six speeds as well. Um, but back to tech, I mean, they started making their, their own uh, products, shifters and uh, the billet one, two forks. Uh, they do the billet three, four as well. But with uh, the G-Force gear kit, uh, you're getting a, a, a billet steel one from us. So uh, we don't include that. But also the billet front plate. Um, I use... The one, two billet forks and the billet front plate on all the six speed builds I do as, as long as the front plate's available for the model I'm doing. Um, that way, every transmission that comes out of G-Force is built as strong as possible from the get-go. Do they build that front plate for something other than the T56 Magnum? Um, but that should fit on some other GM applications like TR6060 stuff. I, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, I know they... For the T56 Magnum, um, I thought I heard somewhere possibly they're coming out with one for the, uh, the TR6060 Corvette. Um, nice. Don't know if that's true or not, but that is a product we're asked about a lot uh, for the Corvette guys. Um, and they can also change up uh, how they do their spray bar system because on the Corvettes, uh, it's actually a pump built into the front of uh, uh, the, the cast front plate. Where again with the tech one, they they have a little bit different of a setup. I think works a little better. Um, but yeah, so that's why we we use all their front plates. Uh, I don't think they have a Ford one yet, so the Ford guys still have to use uh, on, on their Magnum units. We're still using the the stock plates, but uh, we haven't had any problems with that so far yet. Well, and actually, since we're talking about the Ford versus GM covers, you know, I have a Ford. Um, and I have switched over to the GM cover and there are some things I actually like better about the GM cover um, because I had some issues in the past with the, uh, the guide tube that comes through for the hydraulic release bearing on the Ford. 
it presses in from the back and has a seal and that's it. It's just, it's the press fit. And on the uh, GM one, that guide to bolts on from the outside and there's some different options. And I, I've had some problems with that guide to breaking and just some other issues. And since uh, I switched to the GM style front cover, um, I've eliminated that. So I, I really do like the bolt on one better. I think it's a better setup than the press in one for the Ford. Granted, there's some modifications you have to make to make the GM one fit, but it's not the end of the world. And it's not that, <coughs> excuse me. It's not that hard. And it's one step in the right direction, Bill. <clears throat> Thanks, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so Mark, in our world, like we talked about, you know, the T56, the TKX, the TKO, 500, 600, the G101A, the GF5R, those are like the most popular transmissions. Um, can, can you give a rundown of the ideal applications for these guys? Like those transmissions, like what, uh, like maybe some of those are not the best for the street, but better for the track or whatever. Yeah, so we'll start with G101A. Um, that transmission we use in quite a few different applications. Um, Anywhere from from drag racing, uh, we have uh, like a whole coyote stock class um, to your you know your weekend guys. Uh, they'll run the G one hundred and one A, perfect for you know quarter mile or uh, eighth mile racing. Um, some guys will use it for going to track, and if they you know go to local car shows, uh, you know they could take it down the street. Uh, it still works fine. You just don't have that overdrive. Um, a so lot that's of these a, guys, that's a four speed. That's a four speed. Yeah. Okay. Um, that replaced a lot of guys who were using the the older T5s, which obviously um, with today's power and, and everything, we're not holding up. It, the T5 is, is a street transmission no matter how you build it. Um, so a lot of guys transition uh, from the T5 to the G101A. Uh, they don't need the overdrive, and it's, it's a purpose-built transmission, so it works out great. Uh, GF5R, same thing, uh, drag racing. Uh, a lot of guys were before the before the six speeds were using the five R for you know drag and drive events. Um, most notably, uh, Finnegan and he just switched over to what you guys have uh, with with the Magnum um, because the five R was just too loud without any you know in a, a full belt race car. There's really no material to dampen the noise. Uh, so they were driving around with headphones on. Um, where obviously you guys know uh, the six speeds going to be noisier than an oem one but it's not going to be anywhere near as loud as a, a full straight cut uh dog ring transmission um so a lot of guys would switch over to that but that's still big and uh, uh drag racing as well if you need a clutch assisted uh setup uh, we offer h pattern or v gate shifters um if you need a full clutchless setup we do have the gf2400 uh four speed and the gf2000 five speed um and by fully clutchless i mean it's drag race only if you let off the throttle um it's going to kick it back into neutral because the the sliders are overlapping so there's back ramps to prevent it from getting into two gears at once so basically you use your clutch for first and reverse uh after that you you just go until you're done with the run uh unfortunately with that transmission if you have to let off the throttle uh you, you need to abort your run um because you're not going to get it uh, back in the gear without um, without a lot of hassle. It's not going to work out too good. Um, and then and the all G the trans. Yep. Go ahead. So the G five R GF five R is a five speed. Is that what the five means? Uh yeah. Sorry, the okay. uh, GF five R is a five speed. Yeah. yeah, got it. Go. Does it mean go forward five and then R is reverse or race? <laughs> I believe it's actually G force five speed racing. <laughs> okay got a it. lot of people that's a good way to remember it because uh, a lot of people we get calls for that transmission all the time and uh people have a lot of trouble saying that one so we kind of regret naming it that but that's basically a good way to remember it g-force five-speed racing got it all right <clears throat> um yeah so i think you covered the ideal applications uh, for those that's awesome um and then what, what are the horsepower readings for the, the GF4A and the GSR? So actually the G101A, the GF4A, and the GSR are internally pretty much the same. Uh, the GSR does use a bigger headset or uh, the, the fourth gear. Um, so that is a little bit 
stronger uh, as far as the headset goes. But we rate all those at about 1,000 flywheel horsepower, about 900 uh, foot-pounds torque. Um, in a drag racing uh, or circle track setup, we've seen them in uh, drift um, go as, as high as 1,400 um, without uh, without any issues. Uh, so it depends on what uh, what kind of racing they're doing as well. You know, and I think Rich Rich is the same. We get lots of random questions, like through all the different social media outputs. And I always tell people, because they're like, well, how much power can this handle? I'm like, man, it, until you get traction, it'll handle it. Like, it's you're going to break it till you get traction. And, um, you know, you just keep your radial tires on it and just spin them, spin them all day long. You'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that, that is that's the other piece of the technology that's changed is suspensions, tire technology, all that stuff has changed um and and has gotten more aggressive too. So for us thick guys, the clutch technology is important that the two of them are keeping up with you with each other for sure. Well, and 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 literally Rich, uh you and I have talked about this a ton, but <clears throat> the really fast stick guys they're running a radio um yeah. and that's a fine line because i think if you don't have everything sorted and you throw a radial on your stick car you're gonna start breaking stuff if you don't have it right as far as clutch slip and chassis and everything else um i mean would you, you would agree you, you nor i have ventured in this the radial territory yet no with my clutch i've definitely debated it most recently uh, people were asking me <laughs> uh yesterday actually when are you going to go to a radial and the tracks that don't have great prep around here, um, some there's a couple of them that do, but uh, I don't know. I think it's just that much um, more forgiving with, uh, especially on a four thousand pound car, because that little bit of that little bit of movement that the slick gives you yeah. is a little bit that the, the transmission doesn't have to take too. So, it seems to be working well for me. Yeah, and my biggest concern is always. It seems like it's not that often that that you and I or race week and stuff. I mean, the automatic guys get away with it, but you know, how often is the track prep like set on kill for radial setup? Cause I mean, we shake the tires and spin them occasionally, even on a, on a three, four shift. Sometimes I've done it. Um, and a radial won't recover. Whereas a slick, yeah. you know, I've heard that a slick can still work really well at like 40% slip. I don't want to be driving it like that, but it's, it still works. <laughs> so Good entertainment, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, um, mark do you have any upcoming uh, events or products that you can talk about and or are excited about uh well pri is probably the next event i don't know if i'll make world cup this year uh although i want to because that's where all these uh the the, the six feet guys break the records uh, in the cool air um yeah. But if I don't make it down to that, PRI will be my next event, and uh, that's that's December. And anything new will will take there. It was the, the TR sixty sixty T fifty six Magnum set is pretty much the newest thing we have out right now. Um, there's just twelve different applications. Like everyone has a different input shaft, so we're still uh, working on getting more um, uh, more input shouts out for like the the Corvettes, the Camaros, the challengers the hellcat um right now we have uh the gear kit with the input shafts for f magnum um obviously ford like like you run uh gm uh like like rich and a lot of the other guys run um so we're going to continue working on that uh getting more kits out for that and then uh hopefully next year we'll start on some some new projects uh, I, I don't know what the bosses have in store but um Sure, it'd be some some nice new stuff uh, for the newer transmissions that are coming out that are manual. So, did you want my car or Bill's car in the booth at PRI? Well, I don't think our booth is big enough. We'd have to get a bigger booth. Well, that <laughs> sounds like you could, yeah, you could still do that. I mean, for both of us, you just need a little bigger booth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could drive mine down in the winter, but I'd have to tow a trailer, so we'd have to find room for the trailer as well. But and not, would the trailer not, be full not... of clean, cleaning supplies <laughs> after that yeah, drive? Down? Wait. Yeah, yeah. Mud flaps and winter tires are a must. <clears throat> nice, nice. Um so is there a shifter that you like for the for the T fifty sixes? 
for the Tremex? Like you guys built, do you build a shifter? Uh, we do shifters for our own design transmissions, like uh, the G101A, the 5R, the 2000. Uh, we do not do shifters for uh, like the Tremec based stuff um, that we do gear sets for. Um, but I, in, in my, I have a 2004 GTL, I, I run the, the tip shifter in that. Uh, I haven't gotten too much drive time on it uh, just because I need, need to get some work done on the car. Uh, but as, as much as I did drive it, I, I do like that shifter. Um, it actually makes the car seem like a, a lot newer of a car versus the uh, old OEM sloppy shifter that was in it. So uh, I like the tick shifter. I know there are guys out there uh, use MGW. Uh, that's a good shifter as well. Um, I don't know what you guys use. I'm sure you can give some insight on, on that as well. What do you run, Rich? I'm actually running a white lightning from American Powertrain. I've had it on the car for quite some time, actually. It's been it's been pretty good for me so far. Yeah, and, and I, I used to run one of those. Um <clears throat> and now I have uh one of the short throw ones from Red Roberts Racing. Um and I've had pretty good luck with it. There's some bits and pieces in there that wear um you know, not because they're made poorly, but probably because I just abuse the hell out of it. Um, but it's generally been pretty good. I'm pretty pleased with it. So, yeah. Um, so we have, we, Mark, we have a couple of questions from the um, Stick Shift Nation uh, Facebook page. And, and I definitely want to get a big thanks out to them for hosting this podcast and just kind of helping with all the logistics and the graphics and uploads uh, travis foster does an awesome job with that stuff so also uh, check out stickracing.com. but some of the questions from uh, folks on there um can g4 set up a shifter for a ford top loader is that even is that a trick question or i don't even know <laughs> so that would actually uh, probably be a better question for chris uh, in, in the shifter department over long shifters um I'm sure he could probably come up with a setup that, that would work on that. Okay. Um, I would say to call into to Chris or um, if that's uh, posted in uh, Stick Shift Nation, I can get an answer on that and get back to him. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> Rich, you want to take the next one? Yeah, here's another one. Uh, my car is 2,800 pounds. Oh, my God, that would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I gave you this one. <laughs> give me a man with that. <laughs> Would that be like a GTO and, uh, and a half? <laughs> yeah. Um, and fourteen hundred horsepower. I want to go H pattern racing. I don't need an overdrive. What is the best option for me? That's the uh, yeah. I mean, if uh, what did you say fourteen hundred horsepower? Yeah. yeah. Um, at that weight, I'd say he'd probably be good with. Uh, um, you know, he could use, if he doesn't need to overdrive, the GF5R. Uh, we rate those to uh, about 1,300, again, and a 3,200-pound car. So he's a little lighter. Um, he can get away with uh, a little more horsepower, a little, a little more torque. Um, but the 5R would be the strongest that we make um, as a purpose-built transmission uh, in H pattern. Um, but obviously, as you guys know, the if you, if you would use – overdrives where you could delete the fifth and sixth uh, and use a six speed. But as far as a purpose built transmission, I think the GF5R would be a, a good fit for that. Um, would the, would the G101A work also? Is that another option? I think that, that would just be a little too much power. Cause again, we're, we're about for drag racing. We rate that at about a thousand uh, flywheel horsepower, about 900 torque. Um, and really the 5R and the 101A use a lot of the same gears, but, the 5R is a split case design, um, and there's some design differences that will allow it to handle a little bit more power than, than say, the G101A. So he could use the 101 if he just did hard tire stuff, right? No slicks? Uh, yeah, yeah. If he put <laughs> slicks on it, I'd say he'd be in trouble. That would be more like drifting, right? <laughs> well, yeah, the drift guys, um, a lot of people think they, they don't hook up, uh, but... I mean, if you ever listen to his cars and stuff, they're they're gripping the whole time around, and uh, uh, I mean, it's amazing that that uh, they hold up to the abuse the the drift guys put uh, 
put to them. But drag racing with slicks, yeah, I think it would be a little too much for the, the 101A. The 5R would probably be the better ticket. <clears throat> Got it. Got it. <sighs> um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, uh, what can a consumer do to prepare himself uh, before he calls you, you know, I, I, I always try to be very conscious whenever I'm dealing with anybody um, like yourself that I don't waste your time. And uh, so I like to hear from shop owners, like, you know, how, how does a person set himself up? So when he calls you, he doesn't waste your time. He gets the info he wants and hopefully gets the parts he wants. I'd say a few things. Um, just make sure you're in a good area where you have good uh, cell phone service. If, if you're on a cell phone, um, we get a lot. And I know that's hard to control, uh, but if you're able to do so, that helps out a lot because uh, a lot of calls do get, get dropped in and out. Um, also, I would say try not to be driving. We get a lot of guys that are driving and uh, we'll give them all the information and then we'll have to re-email it later. Which is fine. I, I don't mind doing that. But uh, if, if you could, you know, kind of dedicate some time, uh, maybe uh, have pen and paper ready to take some notes. And, you know, then if uh, we need to send more over, I like to give guys pictures and, and you know, real world examples of guys doing the same thing that they want to do. Uh, so I do like uh, having an email as well to, to get uh, more information over. Um, but I'd say those are two of the most important things is uh, just make sure you're prepared to take some information down and make sure you have a good phone connection. Uh, that's, that's great. I, I probably need to brush up on those skills myself then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the, I, I think the other one is, is um, like stick shift nation and, you know, do some research on there and find some guys that are doing what you want to do and uh, talk to them. Like, and even for you, Mark, I mean, I know we've talked before and, you know, if somebody wants to call me up and, and look for my experience with what I'm doing um, and look for some advice, all that stuff, anything you can do to prepare yourself before you make that phone call to, and take up a business's time um, because time is money and, and Mark might be building parts for Bill and I. So, you know, just think about that while you call. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you guys have been great with, uh, you know, I see um, you guys interacting with people um you know, on Stick Shift Nation and, and the other uh, groups as well that have any um, questions about shiftability. I know I've sent uh, some guys your way and you guys helped them out. Um, and that's what's great about our community. Um, we can kind of share ideas, share information. Um, I don't drive what you guys drive. So the feedback and the information you give me is, is uh, valuable as far as uh, – you know, shifting dog ring on the, the street and, you know, the videos you guys share, I take. And like I said, uh, if somebody gets a hold of me, I like to have that email connection as well because I'll send them examples of, you know, the videos and, and uh, what guys like you are doing in, in the real world with these cars. Nice. So here's a real world question. And it's one I've actually struggled with myself. Um, <clears throat> do you recommend a pilot bearing or a bushing? for these uh, transmissions and does the application matter like street versus strip for one or the other? Uh, we always recommend uh, a roller bearing pilot bearing regardless of application. <clears throat> I know, yeah, I know guys run the, uh, run the bushings and, you know, uh, but we always recommend the roller bearings just uh, uh, for a, a stronger solution. And so this is a, this is a personal question because I, I was running bushings for a long time because every time I tried to pilot uh, the bearing, the roller bearing, it would fail. <laughs> and then it would chew up the input shaft. And then I was like, ugh. and the bushing doesn't do that. Um, but I had problems with bushings failing too. So what, what causes that? You know, I checked alignment of the bell housing uh, bunch. I'm an, I'm an expert at it now I do it fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> what causes that failure? Typically, it is bell housing alignment, but if you check that and it was it was in, uh, obviously it was something else causing that. Um, without really digging into it um, more, I, I won't know off the top of my head. But generally, those issues are caused by uh, misalignment issues. Yeah, and so what I've uh, and actually Pat Miker, um, who has 
a crazy fast Chevelle big block stick shift. It's a, it's a Lenko, <laughs> but he does launch it with a clutch. Um, he recommended uh, like an industrial roller, like a ball bearing, you know, a sealed ball bearing setup. Um, and that's what I used. And so far, so good. It's gone through one race week and some testing and still in there and not failed. And I don't know if those have more load capability than the, the roller ones where the roller is actually riding on the input shaft itself. Um, yeah, I should, yeah. I should have said, yeah, ball, ball bearing is, is what we recommend. Not like a, a needle, uh, needle roller bearing. Oh, okay. Okay. Perfect. perfect. Yeah. So Oof. make sure it's the, the ball bearing. Um, yeah. I probably just stated that wrong, but use a ball bearing. Uh, it's generally uh, better to use that over the bushing. And that's probably why you're not having problems now because uh uh, using the ball bearings nice i think nice. i think the weight of the discs probably i mean when they're when they're zipping <laughs> around in there that can that can have an impact too i mean i run a single 11 inch and you're running two ten and a half straight bill yeah and they're centered iron and they are heavy mofos i mean they yeah are, that certainly has yeah it makes me think about your clutch a eh? that that single 11 inch holds that much power it's pretty it's pretty remarkable actually um and and the the dual disc centered iron setup I have uh, it it presents its own problems. Pilot bearing bushing destruction is one of those. Um, you and I just talked about something else earlier in the week, and that would have been uh, if a guy was to do some clutchless shifting, um, <laughs> how would you prevent input shaft twisting? You know, if you did something like that. Um, and I think we looked at a data log of somebody that might be doing that with a single disc <laughs> and you might see a little bit of clutch slip in addition to pulling timing to reduce the shock load to the input shaft. Um, <clears throat> whereas if somebody was to do clutchless shifting with a pretty hefty twin disc centered iron setup, there is not going to be any slippage. Um, and you've got to, you've got to control that power. You can't just switch off a thousand plus foot pounds of torque to make a shift and then switch it back on. Um, that tends to brutalize parts. Um, and, you know, pulling timing after the shift and then determining what amount of timing is appropriate and for how long, uh, for longevity of parts. is something especially, that I, I think we're still trying to figure out. <laughs> so, yeah, and especially like as these guys are getting faster and faster, um, you know, every little time you're pulling timing or doing anything like that, you're losing some ET. So yeah, you gotta, you definitely gotta figure it out and ask your friends what they're doing. And, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, all right. We got another question from stick shift nation. Can you pinpoint an event, um, or a year that triggered the latest boom in stick shift popularity? I don't think I can name one specific event from one year. I'd say um, for me, it, again, it'd be World Cup where you get the, the fastest guys together uh, in, in port or domestic. You know, that's the whole purpose of that race is to pit them against each other. And that's usually where you see all the records drop. So I think when people see that, it, it, it peaks interest. Um, I'd say five years ago, uh, that's when, when Cletus started hitting the, the records. And then uh, after that, um, obviously, he's brought popularity with YouTube and social media. So everybody was following his car. Um, and But there, there are a lot of other guys like, like Jonathan um, from Tech and uh, the guys from More Horsepower. Um, uh, Joel and Brand and Joel Steele. Those guys... Uh, you know, social media, people are following them. They're seeing them break those records. And I think people see that and it, it gets them interested in building cars. Um, and the fact that a few years ago, there weren't as many drag and drive events, I feel. Uh, maybe you guys know this, but it seems like now every, every event has a second event every year. So there's more of those. Uh, and again, more social media coverage where people can follow it and, uh, Hey, these guys are building these cars or they're driving them, you know, 8,000, 9,000 miles round trip like you, or, you know, you don't even have to, to do that. Even the shorter trips. Um, I think it piques interest because you see guys fixing their cars at the track at the side of the street um, and, and go on to the next race. And it's kind of a, 
whose equipment stays together and, and who's driving gets it done. Uh, so I think events like that uh, overall and then tied in with the social media just piques the interest and, and keeps the sport growing. Nice. Yeah, and I think I think I read somewhere, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong here, Rich, but I think there's now 22 drag and drive events, some of them being just weekend events. Is that, does that sound accurate? Yeah, it, it's crazy how much it's blown up. Yeah. It's bananas. Yeah, that's just, it's pretty awesome. So yeah, even I'm, if you're not confident driving thousands of miles, you could do a weekend event that's just a few hundred. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, Mark, I think that's all we have for you, question-wise. Do you have any questions for us or anything you want to add? I mean, I know it's your birthday. <laughs> uh, no, I think we covered, I mean, we covered pretty much uh, what I think are the important issues as far as, you know, People who have been in it but want to want to maybe step up uh, their program, uh, more power, do more events, uh, maybe not have known some of this stuff or guys that are getting into stick shift racing that uh, might uh, need this information. And obviously, anybody can either call G Force Transmissions or uh, email me at arcgforcetransmissions.com. And uh, definitely, if they have any questions, I can get them helped out. And, and what's your cell phone number? Uh, that that one's uh no. all you guys can have <laughs> <clears throat> no so um is there is there actually a number for g-force they could call or would you prefer them to start with an email uh email or phone is fine if they're going to call in it'd be uh, uh 717-202-8367 um and then they can either ask for uh me or one of the other guys uh can help them out depending on which transmission they're looking at awesome well, Mark, thank you. Uh, thank you a lot. I actually learned some stuff here um, tonight as well. So I'll always use the blue juice. I can tell you that. Yeah, awesome. and I yeah, appreciate you guys having me on. Oh, no, you're uh, welcome. Yeah, and I just want to say, I mean, yeah, thanks for all you do. I mean, uh, you've got me out of binds many times. Um, customer service, second to none. Like I, agree. Uh, I used to deal with another company. Uh, with my transmissions and it was forever and if i would break it i'd be down for the year and now when i deal with g-force like you guys take care of me every time so i just want to tell you how much i appreciate that and appreciate you for uh spending the time with us on your birthday pretty awesome <laughs> absolutely it's definitely a fun time awesome thanks so much mark yep take care okay bye